Okay, again, I'm just gonna put some of these links in the chat for everyone. So here is the exchange. Exchange is where we're putting all things risk five related. So you can find uh, training and education materials there. You can find hardware, software, cores, um, all in one location. Uh, if you are interested in additional trainings um, from Risk Five, here is a link to our Learn Online page. So you can go there to see all of the different courses that we offer. Um, I'm going to see if it'll let me put these in a chunk. So we did, there was a good blog post done this week about the mentorship program. So you can read that um, there. And then the links for applying to be a mentor for summer um, to learn about all the details of our mentorship program and then how to apply for mentorships that are currently open. Um, so good. Looks like we've got a fair number of people joining in. Thanks so much for being here, everybody. We're really excited um, to have you here. Uh, my name is Megan Lane, and I'm the community director here at Risk Five International. I've been working here for three years, focusing on our learn initiatives uh, and helping to grow the student community and advocacy. You can always reach out to me. I will throw my link in the chat so you have that. Um, and most of us, it's just our first name at risk5.org. So if you have any questions about learn initiatives or how you can get more involved, how your university can get more involved, or if you have questions about the mentorship program, feel free to send me an email and we can connect further on that. Um, so welcome. Thank you, everybody, for joining the First Risk Five Mentee Showcase. Uh, first, I really want to thank all the speakers. They all participated in our 2022 mentorship program. Uh, and we're so grateful for their participation and hard work uh, and for taking the time to share their experience and their journey with all of us today. Um, and thank you attendees who are showing interest in career opportunities with Risk Five. Um, we're excited about the future and the progress of Risk Five, and, and we're excited to see that you are as well. Uh, we hope you find the talks and information helpful. Um, and again, if you have any questions about any of these, feel free to reach out to me. Additionally, uh, if you have any questions or concerns or issues during the event today, you can reach out in the chat. Um, if you click DMS, uh, if you click the DMs message, you can direct message myself, Megan, Helen, or Thea. We're all on the Risk Five International staff, so feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or issues, uh, and we'll be here to help you. Um, Let's see. If you have questions throughout the talks, uh, please feel free to engage in the chat. It's it's really a, a great way to interact with people internationally and uh, get to know each other. You know, feel free to ask the speakers questions if they're here. They will be sure to answer them for you. Uh, the talks are pre-recorded, so it really does take away the stress from from everyone being able to participate. Uh, in real time. So if you have a question or you want to just talk to the room about it, please do interact. We found that the more interaction in the chat, the more uh, engaging these events have been. So at the end, we will also have a breakout room, uh, which is just going to sort of throw everyone into a random room and will allow you to do some individual networking in smaller groups. We've done this in the past as well and have found it to be a really fun way to get to know other people. People often share their LinkedIn or how to contact them, their GitHub, um, so that you can stay in touch because this really is all about building community. So we're really excited that everybody is here. Um, and I'll just give you a really cute, quick overview uh, of the program itself. So first, I just want to say Risk Five is working to make education opportunities available to individuals and especially students who are willing to learn. Uh, we want Risk Five to be accessible to anyone interested in participating uh, because Risk Five really does uh, have the freedom of design and customization. So it's available for anybody. We believe that Risk Five is inevitable, uh, and with your help, it's our goal to build a stronger ecosystem. So let me just talk really briefly about the mentorship program. So the mentorship program 
is hosted through a platform called LFX, which is done through the Linux Foundation. Um, and our mentorship program is 12 weeks long. Uh, and the mentees work 20 to 30 hours a week for those 12 weeks. Um, they have a one-to-one -one mentorship um, that they're working on with uh, someone who is an expert in their field and who's come up with the project. So it's a really great learning opportunity and a great way to showcase your experience uh, working on Risk Five. Um, and to gain mentors and, and allies within the organization. It is uh, the first person who is selected uh, as the mentee. It is a paid mentorship. Um, and so the first person receives that. And then we have in the last year also been including two additional people to work on the mentorship, which is unpaid. But honestly, the experience that you gain in these mentorships is so incredibly valuable um, it really does turn out to be payment in the end. Uh, so that's a little bit about the mentorship program and how it works. You do apply um, and mentorship opportunities are open right now. Uh, there's two on there. And I will again throw in the link for you all to check out the current risk five mentorships that are opportunity that are um, available for uh, applications. There are a few other Linux Foundation mentorships. Be, for, be sure to bookmark that page because mentorships come up, um, uh, come up all the time from different Linux Foundation projects. So it's not just RISC-V International. There's lots of different projects uh, that you can work on. Uh, so the current applications are open through February 7th. Uh, you can see the full details and the timelines on, you know, when you would be notified if you had a mentorship, when the actual mentorship runs. So the spring mentorship runs through March through May. Uh, so you would be notified at the end of February and start shortly thereafter. Um, also, if you're an organization or, you know, what's really exciting to me is our new mentorships that we have. The mentor was actually a mentee previously. So how cool is that? I mean, people are learning so much and getting a lot out of this program that they're actually going on the other side and becoming a mentor. So something to, to take into consideration. Again, it's a great resume builder uh, and way to show showcase your risk five experience. So if you are an organization and you're interested in being a mentor. So that's the person who uh, develops the program, works with the mentees to make sure that they have all the um, knowledge and, and skill set to be able to do the progress uh, on that program. So if you are an organization interested in being a mentor or an individual, as long as you're a member, uh, we especially encourage universities, um, community members can also um, submit an idea. So that is open right now for the summer program and the deadline to submit a project that you would like to be a mentorship is March 13th. So that's a little bit about the mentorship program that we run here at Risk 5 International. And I will just, so you've got the link there. That's the main link you need, mentorship program. Um, that'll show all the details of our current and upcoming programs uh, and how to find the link to apply. Again, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me, Megan at risk5.org. Um, and without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump into the program. I just want to remind you again, if you have questions um, or comments, please feel free to interact in the chat. We, we really encourage it. And I'm really excited for you to hear these talks. They're, they're really awesome. And I'm so proud of how the mentees have um, really been shaping the community. So thank you to all of them. And, and thank you to all of you for joining. So I'll go ahead and start the program now and talk to you soon.
Hello everyone, I Edwin Joy along with Priyan Rathi would like to present the mentorship work related to feature optimizations for RISC-V compliance test generator and RISC-V ISA coverage. A little bit about ourselves. I'm Edwin Joy. I'm currently working as a verification engineer at Incore Semiconductors Private Limited. I was a mentee for the spring editions of this mentorship when I was an undergraduate final year student. I'm interested in the arena of computer architecture and embedded control systems. Hello, everyone. I am Priyan Shrati, uh, an undergraduate student at IIT Ruggie in my brief final year, pursuing bachelor's degree in electronics and communications engineering. I am really interested in open source development. I like its inclusive nature so that even an unexperienced undergraduate like me can contribute towards something big. And that's why I've been participating to a lot of open source programs. I was a Google Summer of Code 2022 student and I participated in the LFX mentorship under the Risky organization in the fall of 2022. And I'll be talking about it more uh, later in the presentation. A brief overview of the presentation. First, we would like to give a background on the risk of framework. Then we talk about the contributions made to the different tools uh, through the spring and fall edition of the mentorship. We'd also like to give a uh, few takeaways and learnings that we had through this mentorship. And of course, the acknowledgement. Let's talk about RISCOF. RISCOF stands for Risk 5 Compliance Framework. It is used to test a Risk 5 implementation, hard or soft, against a standard Risk 5 golden reference model. It depends on the following tools. Um, Risk 5 config is a tool which helps us validate the specification of a DUT. Risk 5 CTG is a tool which helps us generate tests for the architectural testing. And Risk 5 ISAC is a tool which helps us calculate the coverage through that test. Let's look at how Risk of works. So as, an, as an input to the framework, we first have the user DUT specification. Uh, which uh, furnishes all details about the ISA string, the different CSRs which are implemented, the nature of those CSRs, etc. We also have two plugins which serve as an interface between the, the framework and uh, the device under test and the golden reference model. We pass the specification uh, file into risk 5 config, which validates the specification and gives out a standard specification. On the other hand, we also have a test pool, a directory which has all the test assembly test files. Um, the framework uses those test files to generate a test list. And using the specification of the DOT, it filters out the tests which actually matter. We have the cover group format file, which uh, has all the different cover groups, which in turn has all the different cover points which are to be um, covered through this test. So, that is passed into ISAC, which helps us calculate the coverage statistics. It also has a dual purpose. It can also be used, it can also be passed to risk 5 CTG to generate a test uh, for this, for the architectural testing. So the filter test list, the, all those assembly files which have passed the filter will be run on both the DUT and the model. The trace files spit out by the model, which will be, will be used um, by ISAC to calculate the coverage. And um, both the models, um, both the DUT and the model is executed and compared. So the comparison happens in the signature region of both the models. So signature region is a region in a memory where the unique values after each execution of the instruction is stored. So if an add instruction is executed, the destination, the content of the destination register is stored in the signature region. So if the, if the content of the destination region is same, we uh, judge that both the model and the DOT have executed that instruction properly. Both of this uh, spit out uh, a report, an HTML report. The Isaac uh, report tells us about the coverage statistics and the other report talks about the tests which have passed and failed. This entire box constitutes the score. So let's talk about the individual contributions made through the spring and fall editions. For the spring edition, here are my contributions to RISC-V ISAC. 
So this file Isaac uses an internal disassembler, which is used to decode the trace file. So this in, uh, implementation of uh, the disassembler is rather static. And as we all know, risk five and static does not go hand in hand. So there's a repository called RISC-V opcodes, which enumerates all RISC-V instructions. A simple add instruction can be uh, encoded as given on the screen. So it encodes the information on the different operands on which the instruction operates on, and also the different values, different sections of the opcode take. So we can actually use this um, and parse it to generate a data structure, which, is, uh, which can be used to hierarchically decode an instruction. So here we recursively mask and compare um, until it reaches the final instruction. So using, uh, making such changes to the disassembler part of ISAC uh, gives us a promise that it is immune to future changes. The next task was bringing performance improvements to uh, ISAC. So coverage calculation is an embarrassingly parallel workload. Um, the coverage, coverage calculation happens sequentially, cover, cover groups after cover groups. So now we have uh, about parallelization at the cover group level. So that saves a significant amount of time in coverage uh, calculation. We have also added the option to dynamically remove uh, cover point once they are hit. So it makes sense for an engineer who would like to know the, num to, uh, to know the percentage of coverage uh, rather than the number of times a single cover point is hit. While decoding the trace file, there can be instances where a base instruction matching a certain condition might evaluate to a pseudo instruction. So uh, we have made improvements to the cover group format file where uh, we give alternate definitions to a pseudo instructions to do away with that dilemma. Here are my contributions to risk by CTG. So CTG stands for Compliance Test Generator. What it essentially does is that it takes a blueprint known as the cover group file to generate a corresponding test. So the first uh, task was the addition of support for the new CGF format. So we discussed the changes which were made to the, the CGF uh, file uh, earlier on. So those need, changes need to be ported into, CG, uh, into CTG2. So the second task is the addition of infrastructure to generate tests for instruction sequences. So we call them cross-combination test generation. And this is uh, corresponding to the cross-comb node of the coverage file. Right. So the cover group file has a node called cross-comb, and it looks something like this. So in this example, uh, we can see that the cross-comb node is divided into three different sections. The first uh, list is called the instruction list. Second list is called the, uh, the assignment list. And the third list is called the condition list. So the first list talks about the different instructions in the sequence. So here, the first instruction should be an RB32I instruction. Then there are three consecutive instructions, which we do not really care. And the last instruction should be a sub-instruction. The assignment list can be used to store the different registers which are used in an instruction. So in this case, we have stored the destination at, uh, register of the first instruction into a variable called A. So this can be used, this A can be used later on uh, to enforce conditions uh, while uh, generating the instructions. So the last list is the condition list. And we can see that the last uh, part of the condition list, we have a condition RD equal to equal to A, which means we are enforcing the condition that the last instruction should have a de the destination register equal to that of A, which in turn is the destination address uh, of the first instruction. So now CTG can take this blueprint and generate a test. We treat it as a constraint satisfaction problem. And this is the resultant test which is generated. So as we can verify it easily, um, the first instruction and the last instruction both have the same destination address. So why are we doing this? So these tests are very important uh, as we can generate interesting sequences to test the different and test and isolate and detect different um, pipelining hazard that could be fall on the uh, device under test. So now I'd like to hand over the presentation to Priyan Shrati to talk about the fall edition of this mentorship. Uh, so it's Priyansh taking over, and now I'll be talking about my contributions. So my work also involved the same two projects that Edwin mentioned. 
uh, Risk v. Isaac and Risk v. CDG. So my contribution to Risk v. Isaac was re-architecting the Risk v. Isaac code base to make it easier to add support for future extensions. So you see, Risk v. is constantly evolving. It's, uh, it allows for new extensions to be added. And here is a list of recently ratified extensions. So every year, a few extensions get added. And as each of these few extensions get added, you need to uh, update uh, the compliance testing framework to account for these new extensions. So what I did was basically restructuring the code uh, to make adding support for new extensions easier. So we took full advantage of Python's uh, syntactic sugar. We made use of decorators and came up with something like this. So basically now to add support for any new extension, you have to just define a few functions in the uh, instruction object class and use the appropriate uh, decorator. So this was my first contribution to Risk v. Isaac. My second contribution to Isaac involved implementing robust tracking of data propagation. Now, first of all, what is data propagation? So in your architectural tests, you need to do two things. You need to hit a condition on the architectural state. The second thing you also need to do, you need to store the signature value from the registers. What is the signature value? The signature value is basically the output of the test which would help us to determine whether uh, our test passed or failed. Here's an example of a very simple architectural state. And uh, we're basically testing on the add instruction. And uh, let's assume that this instruction hits our curve point. So after that, we need to store the signature value. In this case, the result in the destination register to uh, designated signature region. So previously, you needed to write your tests in a very particular way for Isaac to be able to detect that the test actually uh, propagated the signature, but I implemented a robust uh, data propagation tracking using you know, a register tracking and instruction tracking. So now uh, the test writers have some more flexibility and Isaac will be able to calculate coverage for uh, uh, tests written in a more flexible way too. Now talking about my contributions on the CDG, I added basic support for checking compliance with the privilege part of the risk free spec in the compliance test generator. So the thing is, we have decent support for generating tests for the unprivileged architecture. Uh, and we need to start adding support for the privileged architecture. And that is our current focus. So in my work on the CDG, I added support for these kinds of cover points, which put a condition on a field of a CSR. So I will now explain how these tests work. So you've got a machine level CSR and you want to test a field of that CSR, which has some uh, original value. And then you try to write a value to that field such that it satisfies the cover point. And once you write the value, the, uh, the field of the CSR will assume some value, which may or may not be equal to the written value. And then what you do, you deem this assumed value as the signature, as the output of the test, and store it to the signature region. And then you finally restore the old value so that further tests can continue. Uh, so we started with supporting uh, these basic kinds of cover points, and now we ended up with supporting even such complex core points, which even put conditions on the right value and the old value uh, of, the, of the CSR fields. So that is it for my contributions. I will now be talking about our key takeaways from the mentorship. So first and foremost, we learn about risk assembly programming and we get gain deeper understanding of the RISC-V instruction set architecture. We also learned how to use the RISC-V GNU compiler tool chain and then simulate the RISC-V binaries on various simulators. 
Then we learned about incremental software development in both our mentorships. We had to add a new feature to the CDG uh, and you know, the complete feature would turn out to be very complex, but you cannot start supporting all the complexity from the beginning. You have to start basic and then incrementally build on the complexity and that makes uh, building software, complex piece of software uh, really manageable. Third, we learned about adopting a future-proof software design philosophy. This is particularly important in the RISC-V software ecosystem because RISC-V is constantly evolving and you need to design your software taking into account that something might change in, in the future and you, you might have to add additional support. Fourth, we got introduced to fascinating RISC-V open source initiatives like the compiler, RISC-V GNU compiler toolchain, uh, this testing framework, uh, the spike simulator, and yeah, many other interesting projects. Finally, we learned to follow the open source etiquette, which I'm sure will make our future open source contributions way more efficient. So yeah, these were most of our key takeaways. Now I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone involved in making our mentorship a very smooth experience. I would like to thank our mentors, Mr. Neil Gala and Mr. Pavan Kumar. All the work that we accomplished would not have been possible without the fantastic support extended by these two. I thank them for taking out the time from their busy schedules to uh, help us out. I'd also like to thank people involved in the non-technical stuff related to our mentorship. They were very nice and helpful. Finally, I would like to thank the Linux Foundation and RISC-WE for providing us with such a wonderful learning opportunity. So thank you very much. I hope you all have a wonderful day ahead. Hello everyone, welcome to RISC-5 Mentorship Showcase for 2022 programs. The title of my talk is A Software Engineer's Journey in RISC-5. The goals of this talk are to provide a pathway for software engineers who are interested and keen to work on the RISC-5 domain and how the software engineering perspective is significantly important and connects to, to the field of RISC-5 and how RISC-5 ecosystem helped me grow and make the most by working on real-world projects in form of mentorship. So my name is Shazib Kashif and I'm a software engineer by profession. I'm a research assistant at Microelectronics Research Lab and also a Chisel developer at Intensivate. Formerly, I worked as AWS FPJ software driver developer at the Nova project. And I was selected as a mentee for the RISC-5 mentorship program of spring 2022 for the project porting AOSP 12 emulator to RISC-5 RV64G. So let's start with the beginning of my journey. It all started when I first joined Microelectronics Research Lab in the second semester of my studies, where I first got introduced to the RISC V instruction set architecture as well as Chisel, which is a high-level hardware construction language embedded in Scala. And uh, I first time designed my own RISC V based single cycle core, followed by extending it to a five-stage pipeline core implementation in Chisel. The methodology which we followed was first getting familiarity with the RISC-5 RB32I assembly and then getting hands-on with it by creating some programs like Fibonacci series and so on. Then after that, we studied the single cycle core architecture in Logism, which is a circuit developing software. And we created the entire architecture with our own hands. So we had a deep depth information of how all the components are interacting together and what each component is doing in accordance to the RISC-5 ISA. Then we studied the Chisel HDL and we started off by creating some basic designs like adder, multiplier, and then incrementally moving forward by creating the components of the single cycle core, a uh, single cycle core in it. And at last we created our own single cycle arbitrary UI core in Chisel. And then after that, we transformed our single cycle core into five stage pipeline core by following the book Computer Organization and Design, especially for RISC 5 by David Patterson. This book really helped us build our concepts for five stage pipeline and how we can convert our single cycle implementation to a five stage pretty easily. After that, I was also part of the team that researched the reverse engineering of Rocketship. Rocketship is a SOC generator written in Chisel HDL. 
the problem with uh, this generator is that its architecture it it is it has a it, the entire architecture is tightly coupled and uh, that's why it is pretty easy to use to generate a sock but uh, when it comes to taking out a component and using it in in our own design uh, it is quite difficult so we basically reverse engineered the entire sock generator in chisel uh, by using the software engineering methodologies and documented it all in form of a microarchitecture and software specification mss document and then we presented this entire idea in the RIS-5 Summit 2020. So we basically reverse engineer all the modules in form of flowcharts since a module in Chisel is a class and the entire its its entire methods are what operations is performed. So we created flowcharts for it that how each module is doing what, what, what things. And then we showed all the interactions between all the modules or we can say classes in Chisel technically. So we basically showed all the interaction between the classes in form of class diagrams. As a result of which the entire hardware was decoded in accordance to the software engineering or the software approaches by following the object oriented principles like and all its pillars like abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance and polymorphism. Then as a result, as an outcome product, we compile everything into a microarchitecture and software specification document or we call it a go-to document for newbies and risk rocket ship and the chisel infrastructure. Then we presented this entire pedagogy in the RISC-5 Summit 2020. Then my final project of undergraduate studies of software engineering was SOC Now, which is a web-based SOC generator. It is completely based on RISC-5 and designed completely in Chisel HDL, and all the software engineering methodologies were followed in it. So basically, SOC Now is a web-based SOC generator that enables anyone to create a SOC with their own customized version, customized specification, including the core specs, like what extensions do, does the user want, what ISA does it want, and the devices to be included with the SOC, and what bus should be used as a communication medium with the SOC. Then after that, the user can further process their SOC towards FPGA emulation using the web-based UI and also to the GDS2, or we call it the ASIC flow, and create its entire GDS for, with, with the web. Additionally, there is also a capability to produce any standalone verified reusable SOC component, including RISC-5 core, any device, or any bus, uh, which is... Uh, which is uh, capable of a plug and play connection like user can easily generate it with the web and use it in his own design quite easily as compared to the rocket ship. Uh, the entire most important application of SOC now is to provide a means of rapid prototyping for startups who are working on domain specific processes DSPs. So I was also selected for the RISC-5 mentorship program as a mentee in the project porting USP-12 emulator to RISC-5 RV6240. So basically, Android open source project USP is an open source variant of the Android operating system. And after the release of the Android 12, USP-12 was also released. And the PLCP lab, which is a mentor organization in my project, was working towards porting of USP-12 onto RISC-5. And there was arising a need to port its emulator along with the operating system itself so as to run the ported builds on top of the emulator. So that's how this mentorship was offered. Then the AOSP 12 emulator was uh, is completely based on QEMU, which is a type two hypervisor and it uh, emulates the target architectures machines processor through dy dynamic binary translation procedure. The SP12 emulator is based on two, two, two distinct variants of QEMU, QEMU2 and QEMU3. And above that, above both these variants, there's a lot of glue code by USP de developers to make the QMU emulator work as a smartphone since QMU is by default built for the desktop machines. So they provided a lot of glue code to make it emulate as a smartphone itself. So the biggest challenge of this mentorship was to understand the entire the glue code infrastructure and the, and the interconnection between the QMU2 and QMU3 and then do changes in accordance to the RISC-5 ISA. Then after that, I was also a part of the NOVA project in which, in which the goal was to provide undergraduate students a hands-on experience by creating an application class system on chip and uh, running an entire, entire real-time operating system on it. And so basically my part in it was to emulate the RDL on the cloud FPGA, which was based on AWS FPGA and write drivers for emulating the design by using the AWS FPGA APIs in C language. 
then uh, additionally my responsibility was to port the zephyr real time operating system on on for the our system on chip and then run in, on top of it in cloud fpga emulation and i'm also a part of the intensivate as a chisel developer intensivate is a berkeley based startup which is working towards designing and taping out the world's most efficient analytics processor the target is to design a server processor that is 60% faster than intel xeon on the same processor node at one tenth the area and one tenth the power so basically my part in this startup is to look after the RTL, which is being done in Chisel. They are using all the state of the art technologies, including Chisel, Coco TV, and so on. So my part is all the Chisel related stuff and, and like that. So at the end, I would like to thank the RISC-5 team who reached me out and allowed me to share my entire journey with you guys on this platform of RISC-5 Mentorship Showcase. I had an excellent time working with RISC-5 ecosystem in all of my undergraduate period. And I hope all the new software engineers and every people who, everyone who are working with and looking forward to work on mentorships and fellowships and Google Summer of Code internships and so on provided by the RISC-5 ecosystem. So I... That's all from my side. So I'll very, very, very much thank you and goodbye. Hello, everyone. My name is Takumi Hiroka. Today, I'm going to talk about the experience of LFX Risk 5 mentorship with the title Implementing the Level 3 Open Blast Kernel Using Risk 5 Vector Instructions. I'm a senior undergraduate student at the University of Tokyo. My research topic interests are computer architecture and computers. In my research, I spend a lot of time dealing with disk five and LLVM technologies. So I'm very interested in systems programming, including them. Therefore, I found the Open Brass project so appearing and decided to join. After being selected as a mentee, I worked on improving Open Blast. Now, I will now give a brief description of the project I worked on, Open Blast. Open Blast is an optimized Blast library. Blast stands for Basic Linear Algebra for Programs. Blast has three levels computations. Level one is about vector and scale. And level two is about matrix and vector. And level three is about matrix and matrix. Open Blast is optimized for each processor to achieve high performance in those computations. But level three Open Blast kernel doesn't support disk five vector version 1.0. So I will try to implement it. Then I will now give a brief description of the project I worked on. Open Brass. Open Brass uses blocking and packing techniques to speed up processing by using registers and caches as efficient as as efficiently as possible. You can see in the figure. Blocking is done with a register and cache size awareness in order to increase register and cache utilization and reduce access to main memory as much as possible. Tracking techniques also arrange data in a continuous manner in memory, which simplifies the memory access pattern and reduces the cache miss rate. These are the goals I would like to achieve through this project. First, I want to contribute to the Open Browse repository. I've never contributed to all this before, but I have always wanted to do so. This is because it is very attractive to develop software used by many people. And also because I can deepen my knowledge of the area in, uh, and, and improve my coding skills. Second, I want to deepen my understanding of risk of five related technologies. Also, I have had some exposure to risk of five technology I know that the scope of risk of hyper technology is broad and there are still areas that I'm unaware of. Therefore, I would like to further push my risk of technology through working on this project. 
Third, I want to get used to coding large scale software. Large scale software is often difficult to understand where to start, how classes relate to each other, and what kind of processing is performed. Therefore, through this project, I would like to get used to working with large software, large scale software. From now, I'm talk, I'll talk about what I learned through this mentorship. First of all, it, it gave me a better understanding of RISC V technology. First, my PC is equipped with a processor for x86, so I needed to prepare a compiler for RISC V in order to cross compile. The two most famous compilers are Grand and GCC, which, uh, each of which has subtle differences and I used them for putting this five assembly code. Through using both compilers, I got to be able to understand the differences between them. Furthermore, I do not have an actual risk five machine, and risk five PCs are rarely available on the market. So performance measurement had to be done by simulation. So I used simulator software such as Spike and QM. And as and and understood their usage. Also, since I dealt with the risk five extension this time, I gained a deeper understanding of the specification of it. I also learned the importance of breaking difficult tasks into smaller, simpler tasks. In the beginning, I was very nervous about the project to contribute to OpenBrass because I did not know how to come accomplish it. However, my mentor assigned us detailed steps to accomplish uh, our goals, and I was able to move forward without fearing too much difficulty. Specifically, I first followed the tutorial to run the elemental technologies of open, open brass by optimizing GMM for x86. Since I can visualize the results in graphs, uh, it was easy to see the effect of the optimization on performance. Next, I created an environment capable of executing these five vector instructions. Specifically, I prepared a compiler, a simulator, and a proxy kernel. Proxy kernel is a set of binaries necessary to run the simulator. It is easy to prepare a general instruction set such as RVOI 64 IM, but vector instructions are a rather recent extension, and the tool chain around them is either newly developed or in the middle of development. So I could not find an article that successfully prepared an environment for vector extensions. So I had to check the documentation and issues to build. And I had, a, I had a hard time using the correct version of vector extensions at the correct repository branch. So I decided to write a post, write and post a technical blog on how to build the environment. So I wrote a program using this five vector in 26 to compute GMM using 4x4 kernel. Here, I was able to familiarize myself with the risk five vector instructions to some extent. Finally, I wrote a code to compute GMM using a right assembly of risk five vector instructions. At this point, the project is still in progress, and I think it will uh, finally enter the stage of contributing to the open brass repository. What I have also run through this project is that it is not that difficult to contribute to OSS. In fact, I had not yet contributed to Blast repository, but considering that I want, I am at a stage where I can do in, I can do so in a short time. If we take more steps like ones I said in before slide, uh, and build them up little by little, everyone can contribute to OSS. So if you are hesitant to contribute to OSS, I encourage you to take the branch. I also continue to continue to contribute to contribute to not only open brass, but also various OSS from now on. 
and that's right. I'd like to thank both of two persons for their support throughout this mentorship. First, I'd like to thank Meta Sierney. Uh, he gave us a uh, he gave us appropriate assignment and guided us on our way to becoming contributors. He also followed up with us when we had technical difficulties. Also, thanks to Morzan. He's another mentee and worked with me on the project with, with enthusiasm. He too gave me technical advice when I had when I had problems and have helped me when I have what I couldn't understand in the meeting because of the importance of my English skills. Finally, I would like to talk about my future plans. First of all, I will continue to study and develop of the brass even after this mentorship is over. With the rise of machine learning, metric operation, matrix operation will become more important, and the performance of linear algebra libraries such as the brass will become more important. Next, I will be more active in OSS activities. Throughout this project, I have deepened my understanding of risk five and I have always been interested in compiler technology, especially RLVM. So I like, I like to work on courses related to those technologies. Also, I am currently a senior in college and will be entering graduate school in the spring of this year. And I'm looking for an internship. I like to express a remote internship at an uh, overseas companies uh, to make the most of this experience of working on a project with people from overseas. This is my email address and GitHub account. If you are interested in me, uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Shen Wei Hu, a master student from RIX-5 International Open Source Laboratory, Reals Lab, Tsinghua University. Today I'm going to share our work about automatic test generation and verification for RIX-5 vector extension. Here is the outline. I will first introduce the RIX-5 vector extension and the implementation of RVV using cell. Then is the main part, automatic test generator, from workflow difficulties and solutions to demo. Last, I will give a summary. First part is the introduction of RVV and cell model. RIX-5 vector is an extension that provides RIX-5 vectorization support. RVV enables RIX-5 processors to process data arrays in machine learning, media processing applications, etc. The promotion of standard RVV can remove the loop in a program, simplify processors load and store, and greatly reduce instruction overhead. RVV adds 32 vector registers and seven unprivileged CSRs. Each vector register has a fixed VLAN bits of state. Look at the layout. The two sides are pre-start and tail elements. They don't participate in instruction operation. And the middle part elements have two types active and inactive, controlled by RVV mask beads. It is a practical feature in array processing. Cell is a language for describing the ISA semantics of processors. It describes the behavior of instructions and hardware environment of a given ISA. Given the ISA definitions as input, cell will type check it 
and generate many artifacts like sequential execution model, concurrent execution model, etc. Due to its expression type system and static check, cell model is considered as the golden reference model of modern computer architecture ISA design. So Rios Lab has developed the cell for RBV. The cell model can guarantee the correctness of execution, give a non-ambiguous expression for spec, and most importantly, provide fine-grained execution information. This execution log is important and make it a basic component for our RVV ATG. Our cell RVV has already issued pull request and it is under review now. Then is the automatic test generator RVV ATG. Until now, the RIX5 V extension has reached 1.0 frozen status and then we developed cell version of spec and got the golden reference model for RVV. Besides, there are already many RIX-5 processors implement a vector extension like ARA, Sci-5, etc. RVV is being used by more and more people and company, but we still lack an important thing, a test suit. There is no open source and comprehensive RVV architecture test for testing and verification. So why? Write a test suit for vector extension is quite different compared to Scala. Firstly, it has over 200 instructions. The instructions are divided into seven categories and the capacity of each category is close to a complete RIX-5 extension, like integer, floating point, etc. Secondly, there are many configuration parameters in RVV, like vector register length, register multiplier, element width, etc. Chip designers may only need to select a set of configurations. This avoids many challenges, but we need to provide test sets for all configurations to ensure we can support every combinations of them. Therefore, we want to build a test generator, which is highly configurable and can help adapt to distinct RVV hardware design. Because nowadays, the widest used test tool for RIX-5 is RISC-OFF. We want the tests generated from the generator match the RIX-5 ARC tests format and compatible with the latest RISC-OFF environment. This will also help customize coverage points and the coverage report generation. What's more, the ASIC cross-validation flow also need test suit. Our generator generates test pool. Both RTL simulation and golden model run these tests and compare trace log to do call simulation and cross-validation. With the help of cell golden model and RVV ATG, this workflow can run entirely for RVV. Here is the workflow of automatic test generator. Given the coverage points YAML file as input, first put the operands into empty test file. It has not result yet. Then run this empty test using cell. Extract the result of those tests and fill the results in the empty test Finally, we can get the final test. And last, we can generate coverage report for the final test. The first part 
is to generate test items. So what a test needs, one test case including occurrence and expected results. Occurrence shows what data we are interested in. Expected results have two types. One is those can be calculated like add or can be get like load store. Another type is those hard to calculate like precise calculation of floating point square or get the CSR state during the instruction. We first determine operands, that is coverage points. We design coverage points from two parts. First part is input value coverage for RS1 and RS2 value. They are similar to existing RIX-5 ARC test. Second part is configuration coverage, like cover all configurations and combinations of them cover different mask element layout and vstart vlan values. For load store instructions, element address may cross page boundaries for gather or scatter operation. This case should be noticed and tested. Then is to fill in expected results. The method is very straightforward but practical. We extract the execution result from the log of golden reference model. Using this, we no need to simulate instruction behavior, but automatically get them by cell. We don't care about the input values because it can handle every value. It's a good feature for customized input value coverage. What's more, Configurations are independent of this method, make it the best choice for our test generator. As for the configuration combinations, there are thousands of combinations of instructions and configurations. And the table is just a small part of it. We handle this problem on three levels. For each configuration, we write common info in header file that each instruction can use them. For each instruction, we dynamically generate assembly instructions for different parameters instead of hard code the parameter in it. In RVV, there are many cases are reserved. For those complicated constraints, we also write comprehensive conditional statements, like the long if statement. We write them to meet these requirements and ensure every instruction we generated are legal for the tests. We will do cell and spike running on this file to guarantee the correctness of test file. The last step is to generate coverage report. The RIX-5 ISAC is an ISA coverage extraction tool. Given a set of cover points and an execution trace of a test run on a model, ISAC can provide a report indicating in detail which these coverage points were covered by this test. The right part is the workflow of ISAC. It maintains a register state inside. When an instruction is committed, on one side, it decodes RS1 and RS2, read the value of them from register state, mark these value are being hit, on the other side, it extract commit value of RD and modify the register state. So Rails Lab has developed the RVV adoption for RIX-5 ISAC, adoption including many aspects, and now the extended ISAC can correctly cooperate with RVV ATG 
to generate coverage report. This work is also an open source contribution and pending for upstream. So here is the demo of our RVV ATG. Our generator is written by Python, so we need to run the Python script and input what instruction we want to generate tests. Then the generator will run workflow as I mentioned before. So this is the empty test file. We have already filled in the operands, but we don't have the expected result. We use a special number to place the expected result. And this is the final test. The expected result are extracted by the cell log. And this file can be used for testing and for generating coverage report. We will run cell and spike for the final test to guarantee the correctness of them. As you can see, the spike have passed the final test. And the last step is to generate coverage report. And we can see that this test file cover all the cover points. This is all the number cover points. And besides that, we have register cover points and instruction cover points. To sum up, Rails Lab has developed Cell, Automatic Test Generator, and ISA coverage tool for RVV. The Automatic Test Generator provides the most comprehensive test suite for RVV instructions and configurations combinations now. It also has many useful features to help the test and verification in chip design. All our work is open source and PR submission is undergoing. We hope this will help build RVV and RIX-5 ecosystem. We appreciate all the contributors in our RVV ATG project. If you are interested in and have any questions, please feel free to contact us at these two emails. Rails Lab is committed to open source project and we welcome collaborations. Thank you, that's all for our presentation. Hello everyone. Today I will share the porting process of the kernel father named Syscaler on the RIS5 architecture of the FreeBSD system. The title of the talk is No Man's Land, Security Threat in the New Architecture of OS, which is actually an extended discussion of this work. The first is a brief introduction on myself. I am currently a master student at the Institute of Information Engineering, University of Chinese Academy of Sciences, measuring browser and kernel vulnerability hunting and exploitation. In the past two years, I have discovered several vulnerabilities in various open source projects. Here are my related links. And this is an overview of this sharing. Let me talk about why I want to participate in such a project. That is, why I chose such a goal. The first one is for the purpose of learning, since this pattern is a SOTA and powerful kernel father of Google. The second is the purpose of the output. I want to learn about the development of new architecture from a security search perspective. At present, the development of various tools and porting of this file are very hot. On the other hand, it means that some infrastructures are not actually perfect. For security research, 
the probability of finding bugs is very high. Then I will briefly introduce this work. First, the architecture of this panel is a typical CS model, which is divided into a further side that is responsible for generating fast test data, that is, a server, and a client side that runs the target kernel inside Cumul. There is a sysfather demand inside to communicate with the server. The first problem I encountered was that sysCaller is a tool developed by Golang, and the client code needs to be compiled with Golang to run. However, when I started this work, Golang did not have the backend support of the V5 architecture on the FreeBSD system in the porting of Golang first. The overall workflow is showing its figure. After the Golang porting is completed, I need to port in this color next. If everything goes well, I can start the fuzzing process. If I am lucky enough to get some crash samples, it is likely to become a new zero-day vulnerability after analysis. I just mentioned that Golang did not have the FreeBSD and V5 architecture support at that time. So I first refer to the work in progress porting of others, such as ARM and MIPS on FreeBSD and V5 on Linux, so that both system-related and architecture-related code have examples. The porting process basically includes the creation and filling of the basic template files, as well as a supplementary assembly code that the backend compiler needs to use when performing this code code image. I use IDA Pro a lot to diverse existing libraries to help me write assembly code. In addition, the mentor's guidance helped me solve many problems. Thanks a lot to my mentors. Then I started to modify the code of syscaler, which is relatively simple, because there is only the client code need to be changed, including adding some macro values in the risk farm architecture, adding some configurations such as cumul parameters, and updating the vendor. Of course, some trivial errors need also to be resolved. The father server is basically architecture independent. So this part of code have no need to modify, and you can even run the father server on Linux to fast FreeBSD inside Cumul. After I solved the porting problem of Golang and Syscaller, I was very excited to successfully run the compiled binary farm, and finally I could start the actual fuzzing. The result is good. I ran it on my PC for about two weeks and there are about eight crash samples after deduplication. Two of them are related to the architecture, that is to say, it is a problem in the implementation of the risk fab architecture itself. I listed a fixed issue here, which is a bug in the implementation of PMAN in the risk fab backend. For example, in the super page of the page table that already exists, a certain memory range is marked as a map device will need, which means that the operating system is told that the memory area will be assessed in the future, which will trigger the remapping of the page by the operating system. However, since the previous page mapping may be marked as no replace, it will fail by remapping the super page and then fail back to continue to establish a physical address to virtual address mapping for each 4-key page. This mapping is obviously redundant. In this way, the kernel panic will be caused in the subsequent part of the resource release. In fact, the patch is also very simple. There are only two lines. It is to add a check by remapping to detect whether the target memory page already has a mapping. My mantra also indicates that the PMAP implementation of the risk farm architecture is very complex and difficult to test, which confirms the effectiveness of this color. So after this work, the inspiration to me is that with the development of the new architecture ecology, 
the new attack surface will be exposed. Therefore, tools like brothers that can play a key role in the entire software development cycle also need to be ported, not just a unit test. Of course, unit test is also very important, but it's usually not easy to consider the corner case of new architecture. In addition, similar problems may exist on other systems, such as the ARM or macOS. This is where security researchers need to focus. That's all. Thank you. High performance software for Risk Five. My name is Mazum Muriani, and I'd like to begin by thanking Risk Five International and the Linux Foundation for giving me this opportunity to gain practical experience with high performance, uh, with performance engineering, and with experts in the field. And without further ado, let's begin. I'd like to begin first by talking a little bit about performance engineering. Well, I think performance engineering deserves all the respect it can get because who doesn't like their programs running faster? I mean, even if you aren't a programmer, you've got to appreciate your fast programs. I mean, you've got to love it when your apps are just buttery smooth and lag free. And that's not even to talk about the fact that performance engineering the right applications sometimes can improve how you use power. And that's becoming increasingly important now, in my view, on how we consume power and the role of computation and the effect it's having on the climate. So I think performance engineering is great. And what I spent my time performance engineering was um, working on a project called Open Plus. And Open Plus is an open source implementation of Plus. It's the spiritual successor of Goto Plus. And Goto Plus just so happens to be the Plus implementation that established the algorithm that most other modern impl implementation of BLAS use. So, yeah. And um, Open BLAS is maintained by Zhang Yi Zhang, who also happens to be my mentor for, for this mentorship. In case you're watching, Zhang Yi, hi. So, what is BLAS? BLAS, or basic linear algebra sub programs. Or just a specification for, um, for matrix and vector operations. With machine learning and deep learning on the rise, these um, operations are becoming increasingly uh, important because under the hood, beneath all these machine learning and deep learning op uh, models, what they're doing is matrix vector operations, matrix multiplication, and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, there, this is a, this is a huge performance bottleneck that um, that needs to be optimized and can continuously needs to be optimized. So plus has three layers to it: vector vector operations, matrix vector operations, and matrix matrix operations. My mentorship I was concerned largely with um, matrix matrix operations and matrix matrix operations in the light of the new risk five vector um, extensions. So the problem that I specifically dealt with was gem or general matrix multiply. I'm sure you've like encountered um, matrix multiplications in some form or the other as in your life. And um, it's not that difficult a problem to wrap your head around mathematically, but computationally, it is a non-trivial problem. And in the context of performance engineering, um, 
um, it, it's also, it also matters what your model of computation is, right? So you know, let me just illustrate what I mean by first giving you some context about some computer hardware history. So over the past three decades or so, um, memory performance has severely lagged behind uh, processor performance. And um, as a consequence, memory, fast memory is very expensive to come by. And the hardware vendors have coped with this by establishing this thing called the memory hierarchy. And you can think of the memory hierarchy as this pyramid where you have fast memory, the fastest memory at the top and increasingly slower memory at the bottom. Also, a thing to note is that you have um, less of the fast memory and more of the slow memory. And at the top, you have your registers, then you have your um, caches, your L1, L2, L3 caches, then you have your um, main memory, then you have your storage devices. And that's the problem. Uh, that's the problem at hand. Given this computational model, given the memory hierarchy, now compute gem. And I apologize for my uh, neighbor's dogs. And so yes, that's the problem here. And so the big question right now is, which algorithm to use to implement this efficiently? So can I get a drum roll, please? It's your regular naive matrix multiplication algorithm that you would encounter in intuitive programming? Well, that's just what we use for BLAS. Um, so in order to demonstrate what I've um, showed you, what I've learned, I am going to go through a small little demonstration that I slapped together for, um, just for the sake of this presentation, call it a gem from zero to hero, kinda. And what I'll do is I'll take matrices A, B, C that are 24, uh, 20, 48 by 2048 square matrices that contain doubles. Uh, and I'm going to, and these are random um, matrices and I'm going to keep on um, increasingly make them make gem for them better. And I'm going to use, and the approach that I'm going to use is going to be within uh, the spirit of the Goto approach. So ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. Um, yeah. <laughs> so now you have these basic three loops. And M here is the size of the matrix. Remember these are square matrices of size 2048 by 2048. And this takes 140 seconds to run. This is not peak performance. The CPU, and the reason behind this is that the CPU wastes most of its time just sitting there waiting for the data to load. It sits there. Um, it um, it requests for the data to load. It loads the data. It waits as it takes eternity for the data to load. And once it does load, it very quickly processes it. And then it has more data to load. And then it has to wait eternity again. And so on. And so most of the time it's just sitting there and that's a waste of time and we want to get around that problem. And so the first approach that we take um, that's within some direction of progress is we try to reorder the loops and 
we have three loops and we can reorder them in three factorial ways. I'm not going to go through all the six different ways you could do that I, because I, I already know the best way to do it. And it's this one. And what kind of performance do we get? We get, well, nearly five times 5x boost. So what's going on here? Well, the second loop exhibits better spatial locality. So what is spatial locality? Well, modern computer architectures do this thing called prefetching. So when you load some data from memory, you, what you, um, so you, when you load a chunk of data, you don't just get that single chunk of data. You also get data close by to it. And when you're getting data that's close by to it, you'd be silly not to use it. And that's, exactly the sort of silliness that made our program slow um, or, um, before we fixed our loop ordering. And um, how you'd know that is because um, with BLAS, what we do is we store our matrix in a one dimensional array in column major order. And that first uh, loop ordering was going through the matrix the, in uh, most of the matrices in row, row wise order. And I hope this slide makes things a bit clear what I mean when I say column major order or real major order. And um, so with that first loop ordering, we were going like this, not making use of this data that the hardware very nicely loaded for us. And with the second loop ordering, we were going single stride contiguously in memory. And here are the loops once again. And the next thing now that we do to get better performance is that we start blocking, specifically blocking in the context of registers. So what is blocking? Well, It's just dividing our matrices into sub matrices. We divide C into four by four blocks. And call this is called the microtile. Four, it's a four by four microtile. And how we compute this is we take this microtile of A and this microtile of B and we compute their product to get the microtile of C. And so how we'd want um, the procedure that we use to implement uh, this is called the inner kernel. And this is being done within the registers. What we do um, is that we load in this microtile C and store it within the registers and try to get as much use of it as we can uh, for our computations. And we try to do as much, many computations as we can with that. And while the microtile of C is in the registers, we um, load wedges of the micropanels of A 
and the micropanels B, we stream them into the registers. And ideally, a good implementation of the inner kernel would be making prefetching everything for you. And then going through each and every one of the wedges in a way that you don't have to see them again. And so that you would be being, doing that computation, getting as much as you can out of it, updating it, updating the micro tile of C, never seeing, hopefully never seeing it again. And then you're done. You're amortizing um, data movement with the computation. And another thing that you could do to in fact make your uh, sorting point operations even faster is um, by using your modern vector hardware and you making use of SIMD parallelism. And how you do that is you store every uh, your uh, data in vector registers, and then you do your SIMD operations on them. And how you do that in software is you use either compiler flags, intrinsic instructions, or by hand coding inline assembly. And in the order that I just mentioned, you get increasingly more fine grained control over your implementation. I just so happen to have the pleasure or displeasure, depends on how you look at it, I guess, of implementing the all three of these. And here is a version of the in, Intel kernel written using uh, Intel intrinsic instructions. And here is one using is the inner kernel using the risk five intrinsic instructions and here is an implementation of the inner kernel using inline hand coded assembly so how we make use of the inner kernel is that we wrap it around two loops that are used to partition or block the from main memory the the um the, the those blocks of uh, the sub matrices and then use that to compute the inner kernel so when you do this you get a uh, two times boost and as i just mentioned you're utilizing the registers and this means that less time is um spent moving data relative to the floating point operations and you're also doing your floating point operations um, using SIMD parallelism so that's um, and not sequentially so that's pretty fast okay so the next thing that we're going to do to get better performance is we're going to block for the caches and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be um, loading blocks of m sub c times m sub c um, square uh, matrices m sub c times m sub c square uh, um, sub matrix of c and a and b from main memory and then we're just going to keep doing that thing that we that i just illustrated with the registers on these blocks that we load into the caches and how we do that is the those two for loops and the inner kernel thing that i just showed you earlier we wrap those with three for loops and those three for loops are responsible for um blocking the matrices A, B, and C from main memory into the caches. And if you do this, you get yet another 2x boost. And this runs in seven seconds. 
not bad, hey? So you just got from 140 seconds to seven seconds. And um, we're going to stop here, actually. But know that uh, the cache here that we're just referring to consists actually of the L1, L2, and L3 caches combined. And we can really have fine grain control over that with more loops, actually. And um, if you're interested, you could, um, here is a final slide that I have put here that talks about, that shows you in great detail what's going on. It also references this other thing called backing that I haven't discussed here um, for the sake of time, but that, that also get, gets you good performance. And that is all. And that's my presentation. And I thank you for listening. And I ha hope you had a good time. Awesome. What a way to finish it off. Love it. Super fun. Drum rolls. Um, what a great time. Well, I hope everyone really enjoyed the talks um, that you heard today and that you feel encouraged and excited to uh, apply for mentorships yourself. Again, the deadline for that is uh, February. Put too many things in the chat. February 7th, I believe it is. Let me quadruple check. Yep, February 7th is the deadline for the upcoming mentorships that are available. Um, and so what we'll do now with the people that are remaining, if you're interested, is just sort of pop you into uh, private rooms. Uh, it'll probably be th three different rooms so people can get to know each other a little bit better and, you know, just talk about what you're working on. Uh, I encourage you to talk about your name, your location, uh, your current education level, and maybe any dream product projects that you would like to work on. Uh, with Risk Five, So I will go ahead and create those rooms now. And feel free to stay in those for about 10 minutes. Uh, if you're having a great time, I'll pop in and out of them and, and we can keep them open for longer. But, but please do engage. Feel free to come on video. Um, this is a great opportunity for you to meet people from all around the world that work on projects you also enjoy. So give me one second. There you go.